Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the diversity of Spiralians and the common ancestor of bilaterally symmetric animals. So let's jump right in. Before we dive into the tale, there's some fascinating breaking news in a recent paper in the journal Science that relates to the previous tale, published just after we put the video out on YouTube. The study concerns the endostyle and the origins of pharyngeal-derived organs in vertebrates. Remember that the endostyle of lancelets and tunicates secrete mucus inside the pharynx that is used to capture and filter out food from the water they move through their gills. The endostyle is homologous to the thyroid gland, a relationship shown by the fact that lamprey larvae also have the endostyle, but it becomes the thyroid gland after metamorphosis. The researchers that conducted the study investigated the endostyle of the ascidian tunicate styella clava by means of single-cell RNA sequencing and stereosec. To put it simply, with these techniques they can characterize the genes that are expressed by the endostyle in detailed cell-by-cell -cell resolution. They compared the expression of genes to the same genes that are expressed in zebrafish. It confirms the similarities it shares with the thyroid, but they also showed that the endostyle also contains the cells that are similar to the immune and blood cells in zebrafish. It also includes cells similar to the hair cells that are part of the lateral line organs in fish as well as the hair cells of our inner ear. The latter case makes sense in light of what we have learned in the past episodes. We have noted that the inner ear structures, especially the three inner ear bones, are derived from the pharyngeal arches. Now we see that there could be an even deeper connection between the inner ear and the pharynx. Swinging back to the ragworm's tail, we united the chordates in the last episode 540 million years ago at the very start of the Cambrian. Today we are first joining the clade Ambulacraria, which includes at least the echinoderms and hemichordates at around 550 million years ago in the late Ediacaran period. At this point, common ancestor dates start getting contentious. Some studies, for instance, place our common ancestor with Ambulacraria as far back as 660 million years ago. The reason is in part that beyond here we are so deep in the past that fossils bear few diagnostic characteristics that allow us to assign them to particular clades with any certainty. Because there are few fossils we can confidently use as a node for doing molecular clock studies, date estimates provided by genes alone may span quite a large range. We'll explore this issue in much greater detail in The Velvet Worm's Tale, a few episodes from now. Ambulacrarians, however, have an enormous fossil record. Before we get to those fossils, let's meet some modern members. The more famous of the two extant ambulacrarian clades has to be the phylum Echinodermata. The starfish, Asteroidea, brittle stars, Ophiaroidea, sea lilies, or feather stars, Crinoidea, sea cucumbers, Holotheroidea, and sea urchins, Echinoidea. Two unifying characteristics of these clades are their possession of a high magnesium calcite mesodermal endoskeleton, which is the main reason for why they left such a fossil record, being constructed of plates made of a porous meshwork material called stereome that is covered by epidermis, and their hydrovascular system. Water is drawn into the hydrovascular system by a sieve-like structure called the madreporite, which goes first into the central ring canal around the mouth. From there, water can be transported down the peripheral radial canals and into the tube feet. The tube feet are nestled within the ambulacral grooves. For all echinoderms but the sea cucumbers, the mouth sits at the center on the underside of the animal, while the anus is center top. For sea cucumbers, their mouth is on the ventral anterior end, while the anus is on the posterior end. Despite their adult radial symmetry, the larvae of echinoderms betray their ancestry. Echinoderm larvae are bilaterally symmetric. 
In fact, the Diplorula larvae of echinoderms look rather similar to the Tornaria larvae of hemichordates. Huge surprise. At first, the Diplorula larva has five coelums that will give rise to different structures. One protoceal, a pair of mesoceles, and a pair of metaceles. In echinoderms, the left protoceal gives rise to the axial organ, which is involved in producing blood cells as well as cellular removal and recycling, while the right protoceal becomes the pericardium that pulsates to pump blood. The left mesoceal becomes the hydrovascular system, and the metaceles become coelums that surround the gut, gonads, and all other internal organs. In hemichordates, by contrast, these coelums basically retain their relative structure throughout development. Some of the coelums even perform the same functions, such as the protoceal, which is also the cellular recycling and pumping organ inside the proboscis of acorn worms. All this to say, echinoderms start out bilaterally symmetric, pass through an asymmetric phase, and then become radially symmetric. Remember that. The earliest and most basally derived stem echinoderms are, unsurprisingly, bilaterally symmetric, like the class Tenocystoidea, which lasted from the Middle Cambrian to the Ordovician. Next is the weakly asymmetric Tenoimbricata from 510 million years ago in the Cambrian, and more derived than that are the clades Homostelia, also known as the Cinctons, Soluta, and Stylophora, whom we met in the last episode, which are all strongly asymmetric. Finally, we meet the first radially symmetric echinoderms known as Helicoplacoidea, which only existed from the middle to late Cambrian. These were pear-shaped animals with a mouth on the underside, just like most modern echinoderms, and had three ambulacral grooves. Interestingly, the fossil Helicocystis spans the gap between helicoplacoids and crown echinoderms by having the overall shape of a helicoplacoid but with pentaradial symmetry, like a modern echinoderm. There is one odd pentaradial fossil from the late Ediacaran called Archerua that has been sometimes allied with echinoderms, but it lacks stereome and internal structures are entirely unknown. Since pentaradial symmetry is clearly a derived state within echinoderms, if this is in fact an echinoderm, then it would either represent convergent evolution of body shape or a highly derived stem echinoderm appearing long before less derived ones. The phylum sister to echinoderms is hemichordata, which consists of the clades Terebranchia and Enteronusta. Terebranchia is a clade of small animals with feathery appendages that live in collagenous tubes. Their fossils date from the mid-Cambrian to mid-Carboniferous, and they are excellent index fossils. Today, however, terebranchs are represented by the single living genus Rhabdopleura. By contrast, enteronusts, also known as the acorn worms, lack hard parts, being divided into a tripartite proboscis, collar, and trunk, and typically living in soft marine sediment. For this reason, they have a really poor fossil record. However, some relatively recently reanalyzed fossils from the Burgess Shale turned out to be enteronusts, such as Spartabranchus and Osia. And intriguingly, these genera are associated with tubular dwellings, indicating that living inside tubes is ancestral for hemichordates. Another fascinating stem enteronust is Gyaltsenglossus, who looks similar overall to modern enteronusts, but with feathery appendages like a terebranch coming out of its collar. There are a few stem ambulacrarians that deserve a mention too. One is the clade Cambroernida, which existed from the early Cambrian to the end Devonian, that is divided into two body shapes. One group is the so-called Eldoniids, like Rhododiscus, that are flattened discs with a coiled coelomic sac and dendritic feeding tentacles. The other body shape is the bizarre phallic structure of Herpetogaster. It too has feeding tentacles on its anterior end and looks similar to the curled coelomic sac of Eldonians. However, unlike them, Herpetogaster is raised from the sediment by a stalk. The placement of Cambroernida with respect to Ambulacrarians is supported by their feeding tentacles that share morphological similarities with those of terebranchs and sea cucumbers. 
Of course, given how far back in time this clade lived, it should not be surprising that tying them to an extant clade is difficult. Vetulocystis and Yangia Hella are potential stem ambulacrarians, but their affinities are tenuous. Vetulocystis has a globular structure with a cone-like base, and this bipartite body plan was thought to be potentially homologous to the bipartite body plan of Stylophorans and Synctons. However, there are no clear synapomorphies tying Vetulocystis to Echinoderms. As for Yangia Hella, it has a pair of flexible feeding arms, loosely organized plates, and a stalk. Though the bony plates may be homologous to those of echinoderms, indicating a transitional state between earlier non-mineralized ambulacrarians and later stereome-possessing ones, Yangia hella overall lacks any diagnostic characteristics to unite it with ambulacrarians. With both ambulacrarian clades covered, we can now pass a taxonomic judgment. Ambulacraria is a bad name for this clade. As mentioned earlier, ambulacral grooves are a derived characteristic of echinoderms. They are not synapomorphic to all ambulacrarians. Having diplorula larva with five coelums is a synapomorphy of ambulacraria. The reason this irks me is that taxonomic categories are arbitrary conventions of convenience. If the name doesn't convey a synapomorphy of the clade it encompasses, then what's the point of the name? For simplicity's sake, we are next going to move on to the clade that is traditionally considered sister to Deuterostomia. Protostomia. The existence of protostomia has long been well supported in phylogenetic analyses and is typically split into two clades, Spiralia and Ectisozoa. We'll meet the Ectisozoans in the next tale. Spiralia refers to spiral cleavage. This is when the zygote begins dividing into more cells from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, and so on. In spiral cleavage, rather than the cells staying in the same plane as each other, which is called radial cleavage, they arise at an angle to the underlying cells. Radial cleavage, by contrast, is the ancestral condition for deuterostomes, but chordates have built extensively on this original pattern. Most protostomes also exhibit schizocele during development. During schizocele, Solid blocks of mesoderm split to form the coelom. In deuterostomes, they mostly exhibit enterocele, in which archenteron buds pinch off to form the coelom. Interestingly, a number of protostomes also have radial cleavage and enterocele, like catagnaths and priapulids, and we'll explore the implications of this a bit later. Spiralia contains approximately 14 extant phyla. First, sister to the rest of Spiralia is the clade Nathafera, which contains Catagnatha, the arrowworms, Nathostomulida, Micronathozoa, and Cendermata, which has historically been separated into Rotifera and Acanthocephala. The name Nathafera refers to the complex jaws made of chitin that all Nathaferans possess. Catagnaths have these jaws on the outside, but stem Catagnaths like Timorobestia and Emisquia did originally have internal jaws. Based on fossils of arrowworm spines, confusingly called protoconodonts, even though they were totally unrelated to actual conodonts, arrowworms were evidently some of the earliest Cambrian carnivores, being found in the first two epochs, with stem arthropods taking over the niche in Cambrian stage 3. What fossils like Emisquia show is that Nathopherans were ancestrally quite a bit larger, a whopping 25 millimeters long, but have shrunk over time. Nathostomulida and Micronathozoa, by contrast, have no fossil record at all because they are tiny, almost totally soft-bodied animals. Nathostomulida is just barely visible with the naked eye, while Micronathozoa is truly microscopic, reaching 100 micrometers in length. We will return to Cindermata in the Rotifer's Tale. Next, we come to the sister clades Gastrotrichia, the hairy bellies, and Platyhelminthes, the true flatworms. Gastrotrix are aquatic microinvertebrates that inhabit marine, brackish, and freshwater environments. They have been placed near different phyla for years based on morphological data, such as Kynorhynchia, Nematoda, Rotifera, and Nathostomulida, but genetic data has brought them to their current position. The phylum has no fossils. 
Platyhelminthes is a diverse clade containing some 20,000 species. Flatworms were originally thought to occupy a basally derived position in Bilateria, but molecular studies have changed that. Flatworms tend to be rather small, with most just a few millimeters long. The reason for their small size being that they lack a circulatory system and are forced to respire through the skin. Traditionally, Platyhelminthes has been divided into four classes. Turbillaria, Monogenea, Trematoda, and Cestoda. Molecular genetics torpedoed this classification scheme too, as Turbillaria is paraphyletic. Turbillaria is a large group of mostly marine worms, and they come in a staggering variety of colors. Previously, all free-living flatworms were grouped here on morphological grounds, with the other three classes being monophyletic. But now, some Turbillarians are more closely related to the parasitic flatworms than they are to other Turbillarians, such as the tiny Bothrioplana. Some flatworms are notable for the manner in which they mate, penis fencing. Indeed, some hermaphroditic flatworms, such as Siphopteron quadrispinosum, spar with their penises, stabbing their mating partner until fertilization is achieved. Traumatic insemination is also common in some rotifers, leeches, insects, and even a few amphibians. As for the three parasitic clades, Cestoda is probably the most well-known, including the tapeworms. Because Turbillaria is paraphyletic, the ancestor of tapeworms was free-living, specializing in parasitism, and then evolving in step with vertebrates. For example, the most ancient divisions among extant tapeworms occurred about the same time as the split between the ancestors of sharks and bony fish. Tapeworms, as well as Monogenea, radiated at the same time as bony fish, and later tapeworms were transferred to tetrapods. Finally, tapeworms colonized mammals and sauropsids. Some tapeworm clades, such as Tetrabothriida, switched hosts multiple times. In this case, these marine tapeworms inhabited Mesozoic sauropsids, such as ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and pterosaurs, before transferring to birds by the Jurassic, whom they still infect today. As for Trematoda, the flukes, this is another group of parasites, and Monogenea is probably the least well-known of the four. That does not make it any less interesting, though, as mating partners of one species, Diplozoan paradoxum, fuse during their lifetime, ensuring monogamy better than any other practice. And yes, there are some Platyhelminth fossils. Currently, the oldest definitive record of Platyhelminthes comes from tapeworm eggs in shark coprolites dating to 270 million years old. Trematode eggs have been recovered from Cretaceous iguanodon coprolites. More recently, in geologic terms, the only fossil Turbillarian is known from Eocene Baltic amber named Paleosoma. Though this phylum has more species than our class Mammalia, their soft bodies and small sizes make their preservation in the fossil record unlikely, leaving us with few fossils to observe their ancient members. Possibly sister to Gastrotrix and Platyhelminthes is the clade Mesozoa, which means middle animals, referring to the outdated notion that Mesozoans were intermediate between unicellular eukaryotes and animals. Mesozoans are very small, highly simplified worm-like animals that parasitize various invertebrates. Parasites tend to lose features as they specialize on particular hosts, because it's much easier to steal from someone else instead of making something yourself. If you don't believe me, H -bomber Guy recently made a 4-hour video on that very topic. At any rate, the possession of certain homeobox genes secured Mesozoans as Bilaterians, and specifically Spiralians but long branch attraction has made their exact placement uncertain. Recent data has indicated that Mesozoans, known as Orthonectida, are actually simplified annelids, not a separate phylum. Diceamida, however, has retained its separate status. All the remaining Spiralian phyla fall into the clade Lophotrochozoa. This name references two important characteristics, the Lophophore, which is a ring of ciliated tentacles surrounding the mouth, and the Trochophore, which is a type of free-swimming larva with ciliated bands. The lophophore is shared by Brachiopoda, Foronida, and Bryozoa, while trochophore larvae are found in Entoprocta, Nemertia, Mollusca, and Annelida. Since all the phyla with a lophophore are not sister to the trochophore-possessing phyla, but are instead found as a monophyletic clade within them, that makes the trochophore ancestral to Lophotrochozoa. 
the Lofa 4 is then a derived characteristic within the clade. Sister to all the others are the clades Cycliophora and Entoprocta. Cycliophora is represented by the sole genus Symbion, which contains at least two species. These animals live commensally on the mouthparts of cold water lobsters. Entoprocta is a phylum of mostly sessile marine animals that live in colonies that are superficially similar to bryozoans. The name Entoprocta refers to the anus being inside the ring of tentacles, while in bryozoa, sometimes called ectoprocta, the anus is outside the ring. While morphological studies tend to place Entoprocta and bryozoa together, genetic studies have split them apart, meaning their characteristics are convergent. And there is currently a single fossil Entoproct, Barentia, a genus still around today, from the late Jurassic of England, which was encrusted on the oyster Deltoidium. The next phylum we meet is Nemertia, also known as ribbon worms, who are either rounded or flattened terrestrial, freshwater, and marine worms. Differentiating them from other worms is an irreversible proboscis for hunting prey, such as crustaceans, bristle worms, and mollusks, which is sheathed inside a fluid-filled cavity called the rinkocele. Some Nemertians are colorful, such as the black and white Pacific striped ribbon worm, Basiodiscus hemprichii, or the brown and white common Atlantic ribbon worm, Tubulanus annulatus. A few fossils have been claimed as potential Nemertians, such as Archisimplectes from the Carboniferous Mason Creek, but these fossils lack the characteristics diagnostic of Nemertians. Given that these worms lack hard parts, this should not be surprising. Pressing onward, we now come to Mollusca. Because this phylum ranges in its members from squid to snails to clams, with ecologies from fast-swimming predator to herbivorous grazer to filter feeder, determining what morphological characters unite the clade are a bit difficult. According to James Valentine's excellent book on the origin of phyla, quote, It is usual to describe molluscan organization as involving a ventral foot, dorsal visceral mass, and anterior head although only the visceral mass is universally present." Close quote. This phylum is split into several major clades, polyplacophora, aplacophora, monoplacophora, cephalopoda, bivalvia, scaphopoda, and gastropoda. First, polyplacophorans, also called chitons, are marine mollusks that look a bit like a flatworm with eight overlapping shells on their back. They are diverse in feeding habits with herbivorous ones consuming various algae, while omnivorous and carnivorous ones consume sponges and amphipods. Second, their sister group, aplacophorans, are shellless, worm-like mollusks covered in spines or scales, and some of these lack the classic molluscan foot, such as Apodominia enigmatica. Third, the modern existence of monoplacophora came as a surprise to researchers in 1957, when one turned up in the deep sea hull of the expedition ship Galathea. Prior to that, these limpet-like mollusks were known only from the Cambrian to Devonian fossil record, so the discovery of these modern living fossils understandably came as quite a shock. Indeed, the author of that 1957 paper concluded, quote, It would now seem possible to reach an acceptable explanation of the phylogeny of the whole phylum mollusca, close quote. Fourth, Cephalopoda is the well-known clade that includes the tentaculate octopuses, squids, nautiluses, and cuttlefish. Aside from their extensive fossil record, which we will return to, it is probably their intelligence that is most striking. Highly intelligent vertebrates, i.e. parrots, corvids, elephants, cetaceans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans, though I have my doubts, live long lives and have complex social interactions. Thus, the fact that they have large, complex brains to match should not be surprising. Cephalopods, however, live short lives and have comparatively very simple social interactions, so one would therefore probably not expect them to be so intelligent. The explanation for cephalopod intelligence appears to relate to their loss of a shell. Nautiluses still have their shell and are not nearly as behaviorally complex as their shellless relatives. Squid and cuttlefish internalize their shell while octopus lost it entirely. The reduction of the shell in squid and octopus ancestors around 275 million years ago evidently placed strong selective pressures on the animals, coming from fish and other cephalopods originally, followed by ichthyosaurs, seabirds, and cetaceans. So their response was threefold. They developed camera eyes, camouflage, and intelligence. 
This is also probably why most cephalopods have very short lives. The few cephalopods who do have long lives, such as the vampire squid, live in the depths where there are comparatively fewer predators. The camera eyes give them acute vision for detecting distant predators. Camouflage allows cephalopods to blend in with their environment, and intelligence probably evolved to help regulate the usage of camouflage. Thus, very different selective pressures led to convergently high intelligence in our ancestors, as well as those of cephalopods. Fifth, bivalvia is the clade of clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops, the hinged, filter-feeding mollusks. Of course, if anyone were impressed by these animals, it was Darwin, for he wrote in his autobiography, quote, The old argument of design in nature, as given by Paley, which formerly seemed to me so conclusive, fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. We can no longer argue that, for instance, the beautiful hinge of a bivalve shell must have been made by an intelligent being, like the hinge of a door by man. There seems to be no more design in the variability of organic beings in the action of natural selection than in the course the wind blows. Close quote. Indeed, there is now a wealth of information on the evolution of different bivalves. For example, prior to the Mesozoic, clams lived largely atop the seafloor or just barely below it, but following the Permian-Triassic extinction, a subclass of clams, called Heterodonta, developed the ability to burrow deeply as an anti-predator adaptation in response to the new diapsid shell crushers, such as ichthyosaurs. This subclass radiated thereafter, resulting in a highly diverse clade. Some members of Heterodonta have reached massive sizes. Tridacna gigas, the giant clam, can get up to 1.2 meters. Oddly, the next largest clam is the far smaller Panopia generosa, the guiduck, which comes from a Native American word, with the shell measuring 20 centimeters at max, though they can stretch their siphon about a meter. Sixth, Scaphopoda, also known as tusk shells, are small, indeed tusk-like, marine mollusks who live burrowed in the sediment, feeding on small organisms, and similar to cephalopods, they have tentacles surrounding their mouth, which they use to capture organisms. Richard Dawkins, in his book Climbing Mount Improbable, makes an extremely powerful point about how the shells of clams, nautiluses, ammonites, teratella snails, and tube worms, as well as many other shelly animals, can be generated simply by changing three dimensions, which he calls flare, representing the openness of the spiral, think clams for instance, verm, relating to the diameter of the spiral, and spire, relating to the height of the spiral. These conventions are borrowed from the work of paleontologist David Raup. Dawkins imagines all shells existing in some museum of shells, where going from shells of one type to another is theoretically possible via a series of gradual intermediates. He writes, quote, Ammonites, those once ubiquitous Nautilus relatives who seem to have come to the same sad end, whatever it was, as the dinosaurs, had coiled shells, but, unlike snails, their coils were nearly always limited to one plane. Their spire value was zero. At least this is true of typical ammonites. Pleasingly, however, a few of them, such as the Cretaceous genus Turrilites, evolved a high spire value, thereby independently inventing the snail form. Such exceptional forms apart, the ammonites are housed along the eastern wall of the Museum of Shells. Names like East and South are, of course, arbitrary labels for the diagram. The cabinets of typical ammonites don't occupy more than the southern half of the eastern wall, and only the top few stories. Snails and their kind overlap with the ammonite corridor, but they also spread far to the west, the spire dimension, and they penetrate a little farther down towards the lower stories of the tower block. But most of the lower stories where the flare rate is large and shells open out rapidly belong to the two great groups of double-shelled creatures. Bivalve mollusks stretch a little to the west. They have a slight twist on them, like snails, but their tube opens out so fast that they don't look like snails. Brachiopods, or lamp shells, which, as we have seen, are not mollusks at all, but superficially resemble bivalve mollusks, share with ammonites a coil that is entirely in one plane. As with the molluscan bivalves, brachiopod tubes typically flare completely open before they have time to build up a coil worthy of the name." Close quote. 
Which brings us to the final clade of mollusks, the gastropods, snails and slugs. Gastropods live in diverse environments, being freshwater, marine, and terrestrial, and exist in a variety of colors and sizes, some with shells and some without. Snail shells can be spires, Turritella terebra, tight coils, Neratina communis, spiny conches, Drupa ricinus, or in the case of the West Indian worm shell, Vermicularia spirata, long vermiform spirals. Slugs, and especially the sea slugs, can be bright colors, ranging from blue to pink to yellow to red, which indicates to would-be predators that the gastropods are highly toxic. As many mollusks have hard parts, it should come as no surprise that they have an extensive fossil record. One Cambrian fossil called Wiwaxia, which has been argued to be a mollusk or annelid in the past, is a stem mollusk that nests near the split between mollusks and their closest spiralian relatives. Wilwaxia may in fact be representative of the ancestor of these phyla, which would explain why there have been such phylogenetic difficulties placing this animal. The Ediacaran Kimberella is a greatly debated fossil. Its affinities have ranged from Cnidarian to stem bilaterian to stem lophotrochozoan to stem mollusk. Once inside crown mollusca, Halkiaria and Orthrosanclus, which look like spiny flatworms with a bivalve shell at one, in the case of the latter, or both ends, in the case of the former, are stem members of the lineage leading to polyplacophorans and aplacophorans. Possibly, they are representative of what the earliest mollusks look like. It is not hard to imagine how something like Halkiaria could have given rise to the entirety of mollusca. Increase the number of dorsal shells for polyplacophora, lose the shells for aplacophora, keep one shell but shorten the body until it is entirely under or in the shell for monoplacophora, cephalopoda, scaphopoda, and gastropoda, or shorten the body until the shells on both ends connect for bivalvia. There are fossil representatives of all major mollusk clades, but perhaps the most well known of them are the cephalopod orthocones and ammonites. The earliest fossil cephalopods, which date to about the cambrian ordovician divide, have slightly curved shells, such as Phytanonchoceros, and then underwent a major radiation in the early ordovician. Orthocones, which existed from the early ordovician to possibly the early Cretaceous, constitute a clade of conical-shelled cephalopods more closely related to squids and octopuses than to the nautilus. Closer still to squids and octopuses, the ammonites are a hugely successful group present in oceans from the early Devonian to the end Cretaceous, whose shells range in shape from typical spiral, such as Parapuzosia, some species of which got over 2.4 meters in diameter, to paperclip, such as the odd Diplomoceros. Bivalves, too, have a great fossil record, as seen in the class Rudistes and the family Enoceramidae. The rudest bivalves often look like trash cans and were major reef builders from the late Jurassic to the end Cretaceous. Enoceramids are a class of relatively flat bivalves that sat atop the seafloor existing from the late Permian to the late Cretaceous. In fact, the fossil record of ammonites and bivalves is so good that many of them are index fossils. For example, the ammonite Pachydiscus nubergicus marks the lower boundary of the Maastrichtan epoch of the late Cretaceous, and the enoceramid Crimnoceramus erectus marks the lower boundary of the Turonian epoch of the late Cretaceous. We will treat the lophophore bearing spiralians before the annelids, since today's tale comes from the latter phylum. One potential lophophore bearing animal is known from the late Ediacaran called Namacalathus. Evidently, this animal demonstrates accretionary growth in its skeleton, a trait possessed by lophophore-bearing animals. There is also a clade of Cambrian shelly animals called hyoliths that have been argued as early lophophore animals based on their tuft of tentacles. However, soft tissue impressions of the feeding appendages have shown they differ markedly from the lophophore, indicating that hyoliths are more likely stem lophotrochozoans instead. The same is true of the extinct class of mineralized animals known as Tentaculida, which includes such groups as Microconchita, who independently evolve spiral shells, and another group called Timodiids. Researchers have assigned tentaculatoids to mollusks, annelids, brachiopods, and other phyla, but more recent analyses tend to favor them as primitive vermiform relatives of brachiopods, bryozoans, and pheronids. Tentaculatoids persisted from the late Ordovician to the Middle Jurassic and were either free-living 
or encrusted to surfaces. Timodiids are a group of early Cambrian shelly animals who have been recently convincingly argued to be primitive brachiopod relatives based on similarities in the shell, meaning that brachiopods are likely descended from a sessile, multi-plated ancestor rather than a bivalve flatworm-like ancestor similar to Halkiaria. Brachiopoda, also known as lamp shells, is a phylum of animals with a bivalve shell which is connected to a fleshy pedicle that extends from the rear allowing brachiopods to anchor themselves to substrate. However, the pedicle of some brachiopods is totally enclosed within the shell. Brachiopod shells are made of calcium phosphate rather than calcium carbonate like corals, mollusks, and echinoderms, and collagen fibers, and researchers sequence the genome of the brachiopod lingula to understand the origin of its shell. It should come as no surprise at this point that the brachiopod shell is likely the result of repeated gene duplications, as according to one paper, quote, five of the 20 most expanded gene families have possible functions in shell formation, close quote. Fossil brachiopods date all the way to the early Cambrian and were far more diverse than their extant relatives, dominating a number of marine communities. However, the Permian-Triassic extinction event wiped out most brachiopod lineages. The most well-known brachiopod, the genus Lingula, was claimed to date all the way to the Cambrian based on fossils that have a similar shell shape, but these fossils are likely not actually members of Lingula, instead evolving to be independently Lingula-like. Stem brachiopods have also been identified in the Cambrian, such as Tianzushanella and the more derived Epistoconcha. Bryozoa, also called Ectoprocta or the moss animals, is a strange phylum. Similar to coral, they are tiny filter-feeding colonial animals and most develop calcareous exoskeletons. Colony formation begins when a single individual called a zoid lands on substrate and begins asexually budding. More zoids are formed as the body grows, which can be subdivided into autozoids and heterozoids. Autozoids are unspecialized and participate in collecting food for the colony, whereas heterozoids are specialized into a number of functions, reproduction, defense, etc. For fossils, one stem bryozoan called Protomilicion is known from the Cambrian. Last of the Lophophore animals is Foronida, the horseshoe worms, which contains only two genera, Foronis and Foronopsis. They are also small aquatic filter-feeding animals whose common name comes from the observation that their lophophore is shaped like a horseshoe. There are no body fossils that have been assigned to crown Foronida with a high degree of confidence, but a few trace fossil borings, such as Scolithos and Talpina, have been argued as Foronids. Finally, we come to another phylum of worms, though this one is probably more well-known. Annelida, the segmented worms. Researchers have previously separated Annelida into several major groups based on morphology, including Polychaeta, the bristle worms, Oligochaeta, the earthworms, and Herodinia, the leeches. However, as with most invertebrate clades, molecular evidence has drastically altered this arrangement. For starters, genetics has indicated that Polychaeta and Oligochaeta are paraphyletic and leeches are a subset of earthworms. Furthermore, several clades that were thought to be separate phyla are now evidently nested within Annelida, such as Sepuncula, Echiura, and Poganophora. Sepuncula, the peanut worms, are unsegmented annelids with one large bulbed in and live in marine sediments. Echiura, sometimes called spoon worms, is currently a subclass of bristle worms that have secondarily lost their bristles in segmentation, while Poganophora is now the bristleworm family Siboglinidae. The common name for Siboglinidae is the tube worms, which are common deep sea animals, often being found along hydrothermal vents. In terms of fossils, some trace fossils in the Ediacaran may belong to annelids, but this is unconfirmed without body fossils. The earliest body fossils of annelids, though, may be the claudinids of the late Ediacaran, and there are several fossils of Cambrian stem annelids, such as Canadia and Burgessicata, both from the Burgess Shale. The crown annelid Danicata was discovered in strata from the early Cambrian of China, being polychaete-like and feeding by elongating its palps into the water column. Though some polychaetes have one feature that is rather amenable to fossilization, their jaws, called scolecodonts. The earliest occurrence of scolecodonts is in the Ordovician, 
during which they radiated extensively and persisted throughout the rest of the Phanerozoic, having been found across the planet. We now come to the tale of the ragworm. I am going to depart from Dawkins and Wong's telling a bit. In the Ancestor's Tale, the authors make the reasonable inference that the common ancestor of protostomes and deuterostomes probably looks something like a ragworm, which is an informal name for the family Nereididae that mostly consists of small marine polychaetes. The ragworm is segmented, as all annelids are, with outgrowths on each segment called parapodia that can help it move around. Sonic Hedgehog is a morphogenesis protein specified by a homeobox gene that is involved in the formation of limbs, digits, and the central nervous system. We'll talk more about homeobox genes in the fruit fly's tail. Because this protein exists in all bilaterians and has similar functions, it's not unreasonable to infer that it also had these functions in the common ancestor of bilaterians. And like all bilaterians, ragworms have an anterior-posterior axis, a dorsal-ventral axis, eyes, and a through-gut, meaning an anus is the terminal end of the digestive tract. Like with the sonic hedgehog gene, homologs of Pax6 dictate eye development in animals as distant as house mice and fruit flies. Researchers have even famously taken a Pax6 homolog from a mouse and put it into fruit flies, causing the fruit fly to make fruit fly eyes, not mouse eyes. My departure from Dawkins and Wong, though we will circle back to it at the end, is based on a huge controversy that exists at the base of bilateria. This big controversy begins with a small worm called Xenoturbella that was previously grouped along with the clades Acela and Nimertodermatida into the flatworm phylum Platyhelminthes. Molecular data has since placed all three in a single phylum called Xenacelomorpha, the acelomate flatworms. These three are small marine worms that burrow in sediment and have only one digestive opening, the mouth. They have been compared to planula larvae of cnidarians, which has given rise to a prominent hypothesis that the common ancestor of cnidarians and bilaterians may have looked like a planula. The acelomate flatworms have a nerve net and sac-like epithelial gut, like cnidarians, but also bilateral symmetry and a mesoderm, like all other bilaterians. However, the acelomate flatworms lack nephridia, unlike deuterostomes and protostomes, earning the clade comprising deuterostomes and protostomes the name nephrozoa. The problem is where exactly acelomates fit among bilaterians. Genetic studies have, depending on the genes surveyed, found about every possible location for acelomate flatworms. On the one hand, a well-known 2016 paper found support for acelomates as sister to all other bilaterians, meaning the characteristics of the acelomates are most likely primitive. On the other hand, some genetic studies have favored acelomates as sister to ambulacraria, meaning the characteristics of acelomates are highly simplified. On a mutated third hand, more recent studies have favored acelomates as sister to ambulacrarians, but with the whole clade, termed xenambulacraria, being sister to the clade of chordates and protostomes. That would still mean acelomates are highly simplified, but also that the deuterostome condition is ancestral for all bilaterians. Remember back to the Gibbons tale that different genes can give different phylogenies based on their unique evolutionary trajectories as well as issues like incomplete lineage sorting and methodological complications like long branch attraction. A few recent papers have argued that systematic errors like long branch attraction explain the placement of acelomates as sister to all other bilaterians and phylogenetic models that remove or lessen these errors tend to find on average greater support for Xenambulacraria as sister to all other bilaterians. The issue is still being debated as a 2019 paper of 422 genes across 195 holozoan taxa found acelomates as sister to all other bilaterians. The point of the paper, however, was largely to interrogate protostome and non-bilaterian relationships, so they were not specifically looking to answer the acelomate question but a 2020 paper utilizing 231 genomes and transcriptomes 
found acelomates to be sister to all other bilaterians. A 2023 paper on the relationships among tenophores, sponges, cnidarians, placozoans, and bilaterians skipped the question of acelomates entirely. So what's the answer? Unfortunately, the nephrozoa hypothesis or either version of the Xenambulacraria hypothesis could still be correct. The reason for such inconsistent results could be due to very rapid lineage diversification in the Precambrian, leading to a minimal phylogenetic signal. In other words, the speciation events that split acelomates and nephrozoans, protostomes and deuterostomes, and ambulacrarians and chordates may have occurred within just a few million years of each other. That minimal signal could then later be blurred by further mutations, giving conflicting phylogenetic topologies. Maybe larger molecular datasets and further refinements to phylogenetic technology will solve the question in the future, but for now, the issue is unresolved. Can fossils alleviate the situation? Not particularly. If it is the case that the nephrozoa hypothesis is true, and that acelomates are sister to all other bilaterians, then the Urbilaterian, the common ancestor of all bilaterians, would likely have been small and simple, meaning it would have been unlikely to fossilize. It would likely have had a nerve net, a mouth but no anus, and no eyes. That means Dawkins and Wong's ragworm analogy would apply more to the common ancestor of Nephrozoa. If, by contrast, Xenambulacraria is sister to all other bilaterians, then the Urbilaterian would have had deuterostome development, i.e. radial cleavage and enterocele, with pharyngeal arches. If this is the case, then potential stem deuterostomes like the Yananozoan discussed in the last episode or the clade Vetulicolia might not be stem deuterostomes at all. For reference, Vetulicolians have an odd tadpole-like bipartite body plan with pharyngeal arches, which earn them a place in stem deuterostomia, as well as possessing segmentation and a terminal anus. However, the Vetulicolian banthia lacks pharyngeal arches. If pharyngeal arches are instead ancestral for all bilaterians, then Vetulicolians could instead be stem protostomes, with banthia representing a more derived stem protostome position. That would, of course, make Vetulicolia paraphyletic. Or Vetulicolia and Yananozoans might all be stem bilaterians. It's very difficult to say. So, as it currently stands, the ragworm's tail has a very unsatisfying ending. We don't know what the Urbilaterian look like. What it looked like depends heavily on the topology of bilateria, and we just don't have a clear answer to that right now. More data and methods are likely to come along in the future to solve this puzzle, and to do that, we need more people interested in biology who want to know the answer. We need more people willing to take samples, compare datasets, and draw evidence-based conclusions. That is how science progresses. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.